Good morning. morning. Welcome to Earl Street Baptist Church. We are so glad that you are here worshiping with us this morning. This is a special Sunday in the life of our church. It's basketball Sunday. There's a lot of green and white Earl Street jerseys around, and that's wonderful to see. We have our basketball teams, players, coaches with us and their families, and we want to extend a very special welcome to you this morning. If you are a guest with us this morning, whether you're here for basketball Sunday or you're just worshiping with us as a guest, we invite you to look in front of you in the pew pocket. There are guest cards that are located there. We would invite you to take one of those cards out, to fill it out, and then drop it in the offering plate when it's passed later on this morning during the service. We are just very glad to have all of you here with us this morning. Since it is Basketball Sunday, I'm going to be recognizing Lucy Wilkinson in just a few minutes. She's going to come and do our recognition of our basketball players, teams, coaches. But we've got just a little bit of instruction for our our folks this morning, particularly for the the basketball parents and families. Children in grades, excuse me, children ages three through fifth grade that are here this morning in the service, you're invited to come down in just a few minutes on the last verse of the first hymn. So the last verse of the first hymn, children ages three through fifth grade are invited to come down for the children's sermon. At the completion of the children's sermon, Children that are in grades one through five, elementary school age children, will return to their seats and finish out the worship service sitting either with their team or with their parents. Preschoolers ages three to kindergarten will be dismissed to go down for Sunday school. Children's sermon is going to be down here to my left, to your right, and when children's sermon is over, there will be folks down here that will help escort the preschoolers downstairs to the first floor for their Sunday school class. If you're a parent of a preschooler and you haven't checked your child in, and by that I mean using our security check-in system downstairs, we would love for you to escort your child downstairs. If you've checked your child in, you've already got the label for them, we'll take them down. But if you haven't done that, we would ask that you go with us downstairs and help us get your child checked in and know where their classroom is, just as a security feature for your child. Then following this worship service, Our preschoolers will stay in their Sunday school classes, will be dismissed from here, and elementary school-aged children will go to Sunday school. If you're a regular member or attendee of our church, you're invited to go to your regular Sunday school class. But if you're a participant in the basketball league, you're here with your children who played, and you're an adult, we would invite you to join us for Sunday school down in the fellowship hall. Chuck Emery, our associate pastor, is going to be leading a, a brief session down there, and we would love to have you join us. The fellowship hall is located directly beneath us. It's on the second floor. We're on the third floor now. Fellowship hall is on the second floor. So during the 1030 hour, adults are invited to join us down there. And then at the conclusion of the 1030 hour, it'll be the conclusion of the second hour of Sunday school and the the second hour of worship. Uh, Basketball parents, families are asked to pick up their preschoolers on the first floor, pick up their children on the second floor, and then make your way down to the gym for the basketball banquet. I know this is a lot to remember. You see, I had to write it out. It's a lot for me to remember. Um, Let me tell you that we have ushers and we have staff members around. So if you're new to our church and you don't know how to find your way to the first floor or you forget where you're supposed to be, stop one of the ushers, stop one of the staff members, and we will be happy to help you get to where you need to be. Again, we're just very glad to have you here with us this morning. As Lucy's coming forward to do the team recognition, if you'll take just a moment and take your cell phones out, Check them, make sure you have them on vibrate or on silent. Good morning. It's so good to see all of you here this morning. I'm excited to recognize our 13 teams. This was a big year for us because we moved to the downtown league, which meant closer games to the church, which was great. Um, And then also we have tournaments this year. Uh, Yesterday was the last game of tournaments uh, for our second through uh, high school kids. And then our men are still in their tournament, and our women's tournament starts later this month. We've had two teams that have actually won their division, so we'll recognize those guys at the end. So when I recognize your team, please stand up, and if you hold all of your applause, we'll we'll celebrate everyone at the end together. (laughs) First, we have the K-4 through the first green team, coached by Mark Acock. If you guys will stand up. Mark's out of town today, so we've got some parents filling in. Are you guys standing there? Hey, hey, wave your hand in the air. Everybody go like this. There you go. They're in the middle. Good job, guys. 
How about the K-4 uh, through the first white team, coached by Chris McCarroll and Josh Shugart? There you go. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> At one. There we go. And then the K-4 through the first black team, coached by Paul Musman and Adam Pfeiffer. Oh, there you go. Perfect. We had 30 K-4 through first grade players this year, which is awesome. And then we have the 4th through 5th boys green team, coached by Mark Acock. How about the 4 through 5th boys white team, coached by Rick Conti? The middle school girls, coached by Ford Simmons and Susan Brewer. The middle school boys green team, coached by Drew Pierce. The high school girls, coached by Hannah Daly. The high school boys, coached by Bruce Starling. Way to go. Way to go. <laughs> the women's team, coached by Spencer Simmons. Anybody? Where's Shanna? Oh, stand up. <laughs> the men's team, coached by Adam Pfeiffer. Got any men here? Tommy, stand up. Why are, why are you guys not standing up? Thank you. All right, and our two teams that won their division yesterday, we have the fourth through fifth girls green team, coached by David and Gibson Wyatt, and their trophy. And the middle school boys white team, coached by Stephen Watson. Great job. So just curious, did anybody have all of your team here today? Anybody? Anybody have almost everybody here? Raise your hand. Awesome. Way to go. All right, can everybody please stand up? Congratulations, all teams. Thank you for a great year. God who loves the world so much, we come to meet you here. Knowing not only that we are loved by you, but because of your love, we have love to give away. We are pursued by the love of Jesus Christ who came into the world. And loves every soul as if it were his only child. God loves God who loves the world so much, may we give our love away. Because, because you have lavished love upon us. We have taken time this morning to be in your presence and to be present with each other as we worship you. We pray that we will be able to love you to the height and depth that you showed us when you sent your son to this world so that we would have the gift of everlasting life. 
We pray that we will be able to hear the words this morning you want us to hear, knowing that each of us may hear different words that move us to serve you in different ways. Sometimes we struggle to understand your words for us, Lord, even as Nicodemus struggled to understand the words Jesus spoke to him. Help us to listen for and hear your word and to use your word in service to others and to you. Your love, Lord, endures forever and ever. Amen. goodness, so many friends today. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm so happy to see you all this morning, and I'm especially excited to see all these visitors we have with us. We're so glad to have you today. Today is Basketball Sunday. You guys want to sit right here? Today is Basketball Sunday, and you probably didn't know this, but once upon a time, I played basketball at Earl Street. It was a long time ago. <laughs> I know, it's shocking. It was like before any of you were born. But I did play. I played one season. And the reason I only played one season is because, well, I wasn't good. I'd never played before. I didn't know the rules. And mostly, I just ran up and down the court and prayed nobody passed the ball to me. But. I did play, I tried my best, and one of the reasons I didn't give up is because I had a team who tried to teach me how to play. They taught me the rules, they showed me the different kinds of shots, they showed me how to play defense. Hey, Robert, you can sit right here. 
And that's not all. They motivated me, and they said kind things to me. And even though I'm not sure I actually got better at basketball, their words of teaching and their words of encouragement got me through that one season. Words are important. They can change everything. A man in the Bible named Nicodemus knew how important words were. So when he decided he wanted to learn more about Jesus, he went to him to talk to him. He wanted to hear his words. And it was during that conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus that we learned some of the most important words the Bible will ever teach us. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Those are the words that tell us what it's all about. God sent Jesus to die for our sins, and if we believe that, we can be with him in heaven one day. What wonderful words to know. Those words are a gift from God, and those words changed everything. Those are words we keep in our heart, those are words we share with others, and those are words that give us hope for tomorrow. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for these children. Thank you for loving us and taking care of us. Thank you for your beautiful words that give us hope. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Father, for the blessings of the present and of the past, we graciously thank you. Our prayer today is that you accept these gifts as well as our lives freely offered in gratitude for all that you have done for us. Use them both 
in this place and wherever you may take us. Amen.
It's so good to see all of you here today. Usually when we have a crowd this big, it's because I'm not preaching. <laughs> um, you may not have gotten the word that I am, but we welcome you here today. We're so glad that you came. Last Sunday, we began a four-part sermon series on the Gospel of John that we're calling Love on a Two-Way Street. And in this series, we're focusing on scenes from John's Gospel that give us insights about how God loves us and how we are to love each other the way God loves us. Last week, we discovered that one of the most important ways that God loves the world and one of the most important ways that we can love each other is just by being present. The gift of just being with each other. Just as God became flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus Christ, there's no substitute for just being in the, fr in the flesh with each other. But this morning, we focus on another way that Jesus showed his love and how we can show ours, and that is with the gift of words. So I invite you to listen for God's word for all of us today as I read from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, as we focus on how Jesus used words to show his love for a man named Nicodemus. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Listen, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. I'm telling you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? You're Israel's teacher, and you don't understand these things? Listen, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Words matter. We hear that a lot today in our public discourse. We hear it a lot, especially in our political discourse. Words matter. And it is true. Words have the power to do more harm than many of us realize and more good than many of us realize. Today is Basketball Sunday, and in case you haven't realized this, people at Earl Street take basketball very seriously. <laughs> Everybody knows that to have a successful basketball team, you have to have players who are committed enough to at least show up. I mean, that's the bare minimum you have to do. Um, so you have to show up for practices, you have to show up for the games. Uh, even if you are the best basketball player on the team, all your talent does you no good if you do not at least show up. You can have the best coaches and players, 
But if nobody shows up, you can't even have a game. You can't even have a team. Or if you have a team, you have to forfeit. So as we learned last week, just showing up is vital. It's crucial. It's important. But if all we do is just show up, we're not going to get very far on the basketball court or in the game of life. At some point, presence is not enough. Somebody, somewhere, has to say something. Somebody has to use words to explain the rules and the strategy. The coach gathers the team around and starts talking. And if the coach is Drew Pierce, never stops talking. <laughs> if the players just, I just threw that in there. It was just a burst of inspiration. <laughs> If the players just show up and start playing without instruction, there will be chaos and there will be confusion and the players on the court will never learn how to play as a team. That's where the coach comes in. Before the team ever plays its first game, the coach has to explain what it all means. And throughout the game, the coach calls timeouts at strategic points along the way to remind the team of what he or she has already told them. Words are so important. And what is true in the game of basketball is certainly true in a more serious way in life itself. Being present is important, but sometimes it's not enough to just be present. Sometimes we have to use words. Do you know certain people who have a special way with words. They just seem to have a gift with words. They always seem to know just the right words to say. They know how to say it. They know when to say it. Well, in this scene from John's Gospel that we just read, Jesus shows us how to give not just the gift of his presence, but also how to have a spiritual conversation with someone using the gift of words. The conversation was with a man named Nicodemus. You can call him Nick for short if you'd like. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, which was like the supreme court of the Jews. No one in Jesus' day would have been considered more of an expert religious person than Nicodemus. So what is amazing is just that Nicodemus saw his need for Jesus at all. Enough to find Jesus, seek him out, and approach him. In this instant, Jesus was not out looking for someone to have a spiritual conversation with. Nicodemus came to him. And Jesus was fully present in that conversation, just as we talked about last week. Jesus was fully engaged fully alert to the opportunity right before him. But notice that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night under the cover of darkness, perhaps so that no one else would know that for all he had achieved and for all the knowledge he had attained, there was still something missing in his life. He addressed Jesus as rabbi, which shows that he already had a measure of respect for Jesus. And he told Jesus that he knew there was something special about him. Or otherwise, Jesus would not have been able to do what he had done. Maybe Nicodemus had heard about the first sign Jesus performed in Cana at the wedding feast or some of the other signs Jesus had performed. Nicodemus may not have known all there was to know about Jesus, but he knew enough to know that there was something special about Jesus and that there was something missing in his own life. I wonder if that could be said of some of us today. You may not know everything there is to know about Jesus, but you know there's something special about him. And you also know that there's something missing in your own life. Well, that's really all you need to have to have a conversation with Jesus. There's something special about him, and there's something missing in your own life. That's enough to strike up a conversation with him. And if we already know that much 
If you know that much, that is already evidence that the Spirit is working in your life to open up your heart to Jesus. Because Jesus was fully present and fully engaged, he recognized the opportunity that was right before him. We talked about the importance of that last week, to be fully engaged in every moment so that we recognize the opportunities that are already right in front of us. Jesus knew exactly what to say to Nicodemus after Nicodemus's opening line. Jesus knew how to take that opening and then advance the conversation. Notice that Nick wanted to talk about Jesus, but Jesus wanted to turn the conversation back on Nick. My mother used to be a master at this. I would call to check on her, but no matter how I started the conversation, she had a way of turning the conversation back on me. And before I knew what had happened, I was telling her things about myself I had no intention of telling her. <laughs> well, that's exactly what's going on here in this conversation. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, kind of sneaking in under the radar to find out more about who Jesus was. But before he even knew what was happening, he was engaged in a spiritual conversation about his own condition. There's an art to having this kind of spiritual conversation. And one of the keys is to just give people an open-ended opportunity to think about and talk about their relationship with God. And this is how Jesus did it. He said, you do know that you have to be reborn, don't you? Only those who are born anew can see the kingdom of God. Well, that's a weird kind of thing to say. Enough to to uh, strike up a conversation, to keep a conversation going, but also to arouse some curiosity and intrigue with Nicodemus, or maybe confusion. All this talk about being born again, being reborn, made Nicodemus want to ask more, to find out what he meant by that. Nicodemus may have been prepared for Jesus to tell him something he had to do. You know, that's what a lot of us think about when we think about a relationship with God, how we can do enough to earn our relationship with God. But everybody knows that there's nothing you can do to produce your own birth. Spiritual rebirth is exactly that. It's spiritual. It's not something you can achieve on your own. It's the work of the Spirit. And so that prompted Jesus to advance the conversation even more. He said, you know what? The Spirit's kind of like the wind. You can't see the wind. You can't control the wind. You can't manipulate the wind. You can't capture the wind in a box. About all you can do is just see its effects. You can see what the wind is doing. About all you can do with the wind is just hang out some wind chimes and see the movement of the Spirit. It sweeps and it sways wherever it wills. Now the very fact that Nicodemus approached Jesus at all was already evidence that the Spirit was already working in his life for all he had accomplished and Nicodemus was at the top of his game. Jesus was telling him, you have to start all over. It would be like being born a second time, being born again, being born from above, being born of the Spirit. The so-called old-time religion wouldn't be good enough after all. It was not enough just to know all the right stuff about God. It's not enough to master the facts of Scripture. It's not enough to know all the right answers or do all the right things. It's not a, enough to work your way up the ladder of religion. For Nicodemus and for us to be saved, it would take nothing short of an act of God. And in verse 16, the act of God is announced with words that are remarkable in their simplicity 
and power. Ancient words. Ever true. At this point in the story, we are left to wonder whatever became of Nicodemus because he fades out of this scene. It's really not until the end of John's gospel that we find out that Nicodemus did believe in Jesus and became a faithful follower of him. But for now, by the time we reach verse 16, dialogue now has turned to monologue. And Nicodemus may as, may as well have just vanished back into the night. Here in this treasured verse of scripture, a verse that some of us learned, the first verse we ever learned. Some of us learned this as children. We learned the truth that the giving of Jesus was the defining, supreme, ultimate, decisive act of God to save the world from itself and to save the world from its sin. Scholars differ in their opinions about whose words these actually are. You can read it and try to figure that out for yourself. Some say that Jesus was the speaker, that this was a, just a continuation of the conversation with Nicodemus. Others say that the, these words originated with the writer of the fourth gospel. But either way, this verse, John 3.16, appears as a kind of commentary on and conclusion of this spiritual conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus. And this verse, this, this verse that is so important in our faith, begins where everything begins. It begins with God. God. The Bible doesn't try to prove the existence of God. The Bible just assumes the existence of God. But just the existence of God is not good news by itself. Just because there is a God doesn't necessarily mean anything good for us. It's important to know the nature and character of God. God's attitude toward us. Before we can receive God's existence as good news, we need to know what kind of God this is. And that's why the next part of the verse is so crucial. Our faith rises or falls not just on the existence of God, but on the nature and character of God. God so loved. In the New Testament, this word love means pure, unmerited, overflowing, creative, redemptive, unconditional love. And it would surely take a decisive act of love for God to save us. So God loved the world so much that he took action. He gave his only son. And in giving his only son, he gave himself. As Hammerstein said, the love in your heart wasn't put there to stay. Love isn't love till you give it away. The nature of love is such that we can give without loving, but we cannot love without giving. So love was not just a feeling from the heart of God. Love was an action from the hands of God. God loved the world so much that he not only opened his heart, but opened his hands and gave his only unique, one-of-a-kind son. The love of God was not some vague sentiment. It was a sacrificial gift. And it was a gift that was both cosmic and personal. God loved the world. The word there is cosmos. God loved the entire created order that he had spoken into existence. But God's cosmic love is so personal that it includes the word whosoever. God loved the cosmos but God's cosmic love became personal so that whoever believes in him, put your name there, whoever believes in him, a 
Augustine said, God loves each one of us as if there was only one of us to love. So that whoever believes in Jesus will have eternal life. So here we see the nature and the character of God. We see the centrality and importance of Jesus. And we see the importance of our faith in him. Believing in Jesus is the gateway to life. Abundant life now and eternal life in the world to come. Believing in Jesus, believing in who he was, what he said, what he did, opens up a whole new life for us that's like being reborn. That's why Jesus likened it to the miracle of birth. Eternal life is not just what happens to us when life ends. Eternal life is what happens to us when life begins. Words matter. These ancient words are ever true. They are God's gift to us all. These words have the power to change us. So maybe we would all do well to memorize this one verse if we haven't already so that these words could become so much a part of who we are that we are ready to say those words whenever we have an opportunity. You don't have to know everything there is to know about God to have a spiritual conversation. You don't have to understand the mystery of salvation. All you have to do is hold on to this truth. Hold on to this verse for yourself and be prepared at any moment to share it with others. Hold on to this lifeline. You can never hear this verse too much. You can never sing it enough. You can never say it too often. It's a verse that will see you all the way through this life to the next. Whether you heard this verse for the first time a long time ago or whether you've heard it for the first time today. Whether we need to receive these words as a gift or whether we need to give these words as a gift. These ancient words are ever true. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. If you will receive those words today and trust in Jesus to do for you what you can't do for yourself, it will be like you are being born all over again. These words are ancient, but these words are true. So this morning we invite you to give as much of yourself as you know how to as much of Jesus as you can understand. We invite you to renew your commitment to Christ. We invite you to come forward and pray or make some other response of faith. We invite you to join our church. However the wind of the Spirit is sweeping and swaying and moving in your life, we invite you to respond. I will be here at the front to receive you as we stand to sing. <laughs>
And now as you go, go in peace, sharing the ancient words wherever you go. And may the Father and the Son and the Spirit be with you now and forevermore.